Welcome to Introduction to Healthcare and Public Health in the U.S. Evolution of and Trends in Healthcare in the U.S. This is Lecture A. The component, Introduction to Healthcare and Public Health in the U.S., is a survey of how healthcare and public health are organized and how services are delivered in the U.S. It covers public policy, relevant organizations and their interrelationships, professional roles, legal and regulatory issues, and payment systems. It also addresses health reform initiatives in the U.S. The learning objectives for this unit, the evolution of and trends in healthcare in the U.S., are to describe the application of evidence based medicine and clinical practice guidelines, discuss quality indicators in medicine, and describe the patient centered medical home and other models of care coordination. This lecture will discuss evidence based medicine or EBM. David Sackett and Associates, in an editorial in the British Medical Journal in 1996, discussed EBM and defined it as the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of the individual patient. EBM integrates individual clinical expertise. With the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research to provide optimal care to patients. Evidence based practice provides clinicians with a methodology they can use to make sound decisions about patient care. The most recent manuals for applying EBM are a handbook and reference authored by Guyot et al. EBM combines clinical skills, which are a combination of training and experience, Patient values, which are the concerns and expectations of the patient, and evidence from research, which involves clinically relevant studies that are conducted using sound methodology, into a model methodology of practice that aims to allow superior care to be delivered. One way to disseminate evidence based best practices is to generate clinical practice guidelines. In 1990, the Institute of Medicine, or IOM, published Clinical Practice Guidelines Directions for a New Program. They defined clinical practice guidelines as systematically developed statements to assist practitioners and patients making decisions about appropriate health care for specific clinical circumstances. Evidence based medicine can also be implemented by using clinical decision support. So, what is clinical decision support or CDS? CDS is a clinical system, application, or process that helps health professionals make clinical decisions to enhance patient care. Clinical decision support systems are active knowledge systems that use two or more items of patient data to generate care specific advice. A recent reference about the state of the art in CDS is edited by Greens et al. CDS systems can have a number of functions in different domains. In the administrative domain, CDS systems can help with billing, coding, referrals, or documentation. These systems can also help to manage complexity by tracking orders, referrals, and preventive care services. They can also assist with cost control measures by monitoring medication orders and avoiding duplicate or unnecessary tests. The classic definition of clinical decision support, however, is a system that supports clinical reasoning, promoting the use of best practices. We have established some of the basic guidelines for evidence based medicine, and now we are going to look at the medical literature to see if we can organize it as an evidence hierarchy. There are a number of studies that are available to clinicians on any particular subject. How does the clinician decide which study is acceptable? Which study is better than another? The medical literature is ranked in a hierarchy, which helps clinicians compare studies. Think of the hierarchy as a ladder, and the higher up the ladder of evidence a study is, the better the quality of the study. A hierarchical organization allows us to rank studies according to the validity of findings. We need a hierarchy because it allows us to grade studies that have different methodologies. It provides a framework that can be used during the development of systematic review protocols to help determine which study design is better than the other. 
It is one method of ordering information according to effectiveness, appropriateness, and feasibility, which are all factors that the clinician is looking for when trying to interpret information with respect to patient care. It is not the intention of this lecture to study the designs themselves in great detail, but it is advantageous to have an idea of how the hierarchical study designs are organized. Continuing with the hierarchy ladder analogy, there are rungs in that ladder. And if we knew what those rungs signified, it would be easier to understand what a study requires in order for it to ascend or descend that hierarchy of evidence. At the bottom of the ladder, the lowest rungs signify expert opinions and physiologic studies. The major disadvantage of expert opinions is that they are opinions, and they are only as good as the experts who deliver them. One rung higher in the hierarchical study design are case studies. These are systematic observations without controls. What are controls? Studies that follow proper scientific methodology and are designed to be true experiments have two branches, the intervention group and the control group. The intervention group is comprised of subjects where some intervention takes place and they are subjected to a change. The control groups are groups of subjects who do not undergo the intervention. Case studies are systematic, but they are observational studies and they do not have true controls. One rung higher are case control studies. These are systematic studies. They do have controls, but they are defined by the outcome of interest. They are also known as retrospective studies because the outcome defines the analysis of data. One rung higher are cohort studies. These are true experiments with controls and intervention, and they are defined by exposure to the factor and the intervention and the control group. The two cohorts are followed prospectively over time, and data is then analyzed. Then, at a higher level of the hierarchy of study designs, are randomized controlled trials. In these studies, there is an intervention group and there is a control group, but both groups are randomized. Neither the subjects nor the experimenters know which group subjects are participating in. There is an equal probability of assignment of subjects to either the intervention group or to the control group, and this makes the study more robust than cohort studies, case control studies, or other types of designs that are lower in the hierarchy of evidence. There are some common terms that are used when discussing evidence-based medicine, which we will define here. The first is bias. These are inaccuracies that produce a consistently false pattern of differences between observed and true values. The second term is blinding. Blinding is an attempt to eliminate bias by hiding the intervention from the patient, the clinician, and even the researchers who are interpreting the results. Obviously, some interventions such as surgery cannot be blinded from the patient or clinician, but can be blinded from researchers investigating study results. The third term that is often encountered is validity, or the extent to which a variable or intervention measures what it is actually supposed to measure. Often there are many studies on a given topic that provide evidence for clinical decisions. One method for aggregating all this evidence is to conduct a systematic review. In a systematic review, authors systematically and exhaustively search the medical literature for the topic under discussion. Sometimes, a systematic review will use quantitative methods such as meta-analysis to combine the results from many different studies as if they were a single study. One of the most prolific producers of systematic reviews is the Cochrane Collaboration. They are a worldwide association of researchers and clinicians who create and maintain systematic reviews with periodic updates to keep them current and relevant. There are other research groups that carry out systematic reviews, and many of them are published in medical journals. Let's recall the hierarchy of study designs, or the ladder of studies. Stronger studies, such as randomized controlled trials, float toward the top of the ladder, while weaker studies, based on expert opinion, fall toward the bottom. Systematic reviews of a particular study design are considered stronger than individual studies, 
So, for example, a systematic review of randomized controlled studies would be the highest rung on the ladder. A systematic review of cohort studies would be higher on the ladder than an individual cohort study. A systematic review of case control studies would be higher than an individual case control study. Case series and expert opinions are usually not combined in a systematic review. When clinicians and researchers seek evidence for clinical practice, they often ask questions with respect to the medical literature in a format that has been described as PICO or PICO, where P stands for patient, I for intervention, C for comparison, and O for outcomes. The first part of a well structured question is about the patient or P. What are the characteristics of the population of patients being studied and the problem at hand? The second part is about intervention or I. What is the intervention or prognostic factor or exposure that is to be considered? The third part is about comparison or C. What are the main alternatives that need to be compared with the intervention? And then finally, O for outcomes. What is the measurement or improvement that is suggested by the intervention? This concludes Lecture A of the Evolution of and Trends in Healthcare in the U.S. In summary, this lecture covered definitions of EBM, clinical practice guidelines, clinical decision support, hierarchy of evidence, and systematic reviews.